All right, well, good morning, everyone. We have 45 minutes to redo the world. So thank you, first of all, to our panelists for being here. So we're trying to talk about with the risk of a recession in 2023 continuing to loom over major economies. We'll discuss over the next 45 minutes on how maybe some of these recessions can be abated, what kind of things we can do to make it better. Uh, there is growing consensus that we're really at a defining moment in the global economy. And with the major trends transforming our economies, maybe could change course, maybe not. Uh, Yesterday, we had a pretty discouraging survey, and the WEF's annual meeting began with corporate executives and economists warning of a worldwide recession this year. And this is a PricewaterhouseCoopers survey finding that 73% of 4,410 business leaders predicted global growth will decline over the coming 12 months. The worst since the poll began in 2011. So that's our framing. Um, remember, everyone, you can do hashtag WEF23 if you want to post on social media or ask questions. And then there's Slido. Slido will be your best friend. Because if you look at that QR code, you can then send questions. And I will weave, of course, all the questions that you have for our wonderful panelists. And I will uh, ask them as many questions as I can. So I am delighted to be joined on the panel by Mario Centeno, Governor of Central Bank of Portugal. Laura Cha, Chairman, Hong Kong Exchange and Clearing uh, of Hong Kong SAR. Axel Lehman, Chairman of the Board of Directors, Credit Suisse. And Douglas Peterson, President, Chief Executive Officer of S&P Global. So thank you all for joining us. Axel, let me kick it off with you. When you look at the global recession, when you look at some of the, the huge worries that we have across the world, can we avoid a recession in certain parts of the world? And what does this all mean for Europe? Well, of course, there are a lot of reasons to get worried. We have war still uh, in Europe, we'll be discussed here in Davos, we have energy crisis, we have inflation. But I think, uh, no, I think the world is probably fundamentally changing and we are entering into, I will call it a multipolar world. So it's not a global recession, not. You need to look to the various parts, to the, Aust uh, to the East and the West. Hopefully the US can avoid the recession. I know there are a lot of voices that say it will be or not. Europe, I trust, will talk about it. It's uh, much more challenging, in particular also for the energy uh, say, uh, uh, situation. But when I look in particular to uh, China, China is reopening. And what have we seen when the Western world was reopening? You know, forecasts were that and real growth was that. So I think when the growth forecast now for China is four and a half, I would not personally be surprised when that would be uh, topped. Uh, we have, I think, um, you just look to the fundamentals of growth, it's population. You look to population growth, um, uh, aging of the population in China versus what is happening in India. There's a, a huge growth coming out uh, of India. So I think there's a lot of hope. And then secondly, um, what we also will see, and that is unprecedented, uncharted territory. You know, for many, many years, interest rates are coming down. Now we have inflation, inflation rates is coming higher. And I trust we'll talk about it, risk-free rate will go positive, and that has some good impact on savers, but that has some real challenging impact on corporates. So, uh, Laura, how do you see China, first of all, reopening? And what, one of the pitfalls or dangers is that when China reopens very quickly, then commodity prices go up because there's so much more demand coming up, inflation goes up, and that's, again, a, a quite a difficult time for the world economy. Well, I think if we look at the key uh, event this year so far, Definitely, the reopening of China is, has to be the uh, major event, and it will be a key driver for growth. I think um, the survey came out and said it's 3.5 to 4.5 percent, and as Axel said, it might tap, top that. But in any event, it's positive growth. And I think the lockdown of the last three years has created pent-up demand domestically. So I would see increased domestic consumption, and of course, the manufacturing sector will pick up. All those will be good factors for the global growth. And, and at the same time, you know, the commodity prices may go up. Uh, they may drive inflation. But I think the world will, as we develop, will find its equilibrium. In other words, I think Asia is where the growth factor will be. You know, not only China, India, Indonesia, these are all emerging and very strong economies. So I believe that Asia's portion of the uh, world uh, GDP, which was 20% in 2010, 35% in 2020, and it's going to be 45% in 2027. This is according to the IMF survey. So there's a lot of hope. There's a recession, I think, in some part of the world cannot be avoided. But the, the area of growth is really China and Asia. 
Uh, Douglas, how do you see this? from So from a global perspective, and I want to come back also what kind of reopening you're seeing in China, whether it's stop and start or whether it's you know the trend that continues. But what are yeah, you seeing? We, we see that there is likely to be a very mild recession in the first half in the U.S., in Europe, and in the U.K. But when you look at the full year impact, it should be very mild in terms of total growth. Um, as Laura just said, there should be strong growth in Asia. China's ability to re-energize their economy after having two years of total lockdown. There's pent up savings, there's pent up demand. So we think that China will see very strong growth, especially as you get in, later in the year. There's a, a couple of really important factors we're watching. Clearly, interest rates. There's a, there's a resetting of the mindset of interest rates. We went through 10 years, 10 plus years of basically zero and negative interest rates around the world, and we're seeing a reset into what used to seem like low rates, 3 4%, and, and now those are seeming high, but the markets will have to reset to a new level of rates. And then there's clearly other important issues, uh, environment, uh, how we're going to be seeing energy transition, environmental change starting to come into markets, new factors which will be impacting markets in the future. But to your question right now, we expect there will be slowdown and light recession in the, e in the EU, oh. Europe, uh, EU, UK, and the US, but strong growth around the rest of the world as it rebounds. So net net growth globally this year. Mario Centeno, how do you see a recession or not in Europe? Shallow uh, or profound? <laughs> well, I, I won't change uh, the mood. <laughs> I, I, I also think uh, that the economy has been surprising us uh, quarter after quarter. The fourth quarter in Europe will be most likely still positive. Uh, maybe we will be surprised also in the first half of the year, but we also see a pickup through 2023. The, the, the slowdown is also natural. Uh, we recovered from COVID. Uh, we have a war in Europe. Sometimes we don't <laughs> recall ourselves from, from that. Uh, and we have an energy crisis that eat uh, Europe uh, quite hard. Contrary, for example, to the US, we are much more exposed to the energy crisis than, than other parts of the world. Uh, so um, with all these uh, ingredients, uh, the growth, even if uh, low that we see uh, in Europe is, is kind of reassuring. What worries me the most is the, uh, are the confidence levels. We, uh, we, we didn't recover uh, yet at all from, from, from the shock of February last year. Contrary to COVID, this has uh, taken a much longer time. Uh, it is eating investment a little bit. Yeah. The labor market is very, very strong, is uh, the biggest pillar of our economies these days. So we'd, if, we can, if we can change this uh, sentiment uh, around, around businesses and families uh, with all the pent up uh, savings and demands that Doug also mentioned, I think we are uh, adding to, to something that will not go to negative territory. Okay, I'm gonna do a quick poll actually for those listening. Who thinks the panel is a little bit too optimistic? Raise your hand. Too pessimistic? Raise your hand. Okay, I mean, you're kind of like, you're getting your tone quite right. <laughs> My worry, uh, Mario Centeno, is that central banks are trying to do something, which is lower inflation. Yeah. And we hear time and time again that it could come down quite quickly. We could have reached peak inflation from 9% to 6%. If we're going to reach that 2% target, are central banks going to put us in a recession willingly to make sure that inflation it doesn't get out of control again? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, inflation usually uh, it comes down quickly uh, when 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 we are at that stage. Uh, maybe we are beginning that in Europe. In the U.S., we see much more. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, figures that that can tell us that. Yes, inflation is coming down. Uh, I, I, I won't subscribe to the idea that it will be uh, central banks that will, uh, that will start the recession uh, because inflation is also not good for our economies. That's why yes, we fight course. it. So <laughs> this, the, the trade-off really sometimes does not, does not exist. Yes. Uh, so uh, we, will, we will continue to, to fight inflation because that's our mandate. Uh, I am confident that given what is happening with international prices, energy costs today are much lower than a year ago. Uh, most commodity prices are also year on year negative. Uh, we, do, we don't have uh, signs of second round effects in Europe. The labor market, even if very tight, it, it, it is performing amazingly well without 
very significant pressures on prices on, on wages so uh, we we again can help uh, on that and the normalization of monetary policy was really needed in europe we uh, had to get rid of the negative rates uh, we must also create scope for interventions if we if we if we have to in the yeah. near future so i think we we are in the in the in the, in the comfortable yeah. process. Yeah, and, and my question was a bit harsher. I mean, I did, you know, it's your job. You had one job <laughs> to keep inflation, so it wasn't like you, you're intending to put the world in a recession. But how much do you worry about, you know, this adjustment, the, the end of cheap money and the fact that actually, if we don't see a recession, it's going to be tough for, for many people. It's that kind of growth that is uneasy, that will sit yeah. uneasy with central Look, banks. Look, I'm with you. I hope we can really, let's say globally, somewhat re re uh, uh, avoid, avoid recession. But uh, ultimately, there are fundamental uh, changes. I was speaking about you know, when interest rates go up, risk-free rate goes up. That is, let's not forget, that is good for savers. So you know, people that couldn't save can save again. So global inequality might get balanced. We saw last year, when you look to the super rich of this world, most of them have lost on their net assets uh, uh, due to the asset inflation that is uh, uh, coming down. You see then, uh, you know, what is happening else? It's uh, the readjustment of the economy. So a lot of countries, in particular in Europe, but basically globally, need to increase their defense budget. That is sucking up uh, uh, resources when costs of capital go, high, go higher, uh, profit margins will get uh, under pressure. So we might be up in that new multipolar world where we still have growth, but, you know, not that great. So it's not a question for me about short-term recession is the outlook for the next three, four, five years, where we probably have a little bit subdued growth, uh, interest rates getting up, cost of capital are higher, rebalancing uh, of, the, the, uh, of, of global uh, I imbalances. Yes, on one hand, that's when you look to aggregate data, but in situations like that, innovation is so key. And I think we need to disaggregate the, the data, and there are certainly sectors where you can grow or even can outgrow energy healthcare and others so uh, I think it's a it's a time for true entrepreneurs these days Douglas yeah so a couple points first on the question about uh, central banks we expect that rates still need to go up that you you're we're not at a point yet where we think that the rates have gone up high enough and fast enough in the in the EU uh, rates are still quite low two percent in the in the US it's four and a half to five it should go up a little bit more maybe another 75 basis points or 100 basis points so that we believe that the rates will continue to go up central bank rates but let me shift to maybe some of the positive factors and as opposed to saying will there be a recession why won't it be as bad as it could have been uh, we talked a little bit about labor markets labor markets are very strong which is a little bit odd to be talking about recession when you have zero uh, unemployment rates around the world. Um, you have, uh, in the U.S., there's more people, uh, more jobs open than are people looking for jobs, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. Uh, that we're coming into a potential recession when, when consumers have pretty strong balance sheets. Even the bottom quartile has much stronger balance sheets than they did pre-pandemic. And then the corporate sector globally, especially the investment-grade corporate sector, is very strong. They raised a lot of liquidity before the pandemic, into the pandemic. Uh, they've been quite cautious about their keeping a strong capital structure in their businesses, strong cash flow. And then the banking sector is particularly strong. If you go back Back uh, 10, 15 years ago, we had the great financial crisis. The banking sector, there was contagion in the banking sector. This was a serious part of the financial crisis. Now the banking sector has gone through a true stress test with the pandemic. Uh, the, the regulatory regime globally is quite strict. We've had now 10 years of stress testing of C cars, uh, the banks themselves. So I don't see the banks becoming a, a source of problems going into the recession. We just saw last week that the large U.S. banks all issued their earnings reports for the fourth quarter and the outlooks. They did, most of them predicted some sort of a light recession. They also increased their loan loss reserve. But there was not one question about the viability of any of those issues. The banks are very strong, yeah. which I think bodes for, yes, a, a, yes, some sort of recession, shallow, but a lot of strength around it. Yeah, a lot of the banks, though, also announced big job cuts, and, you know, they're definitely expecting some kind of slowdown. Are, are you, um, Laura, and then I'll ask the same question to everyone, actually. Are you surprised by the resilience of businesses in your region, but even across the world? Is it normal that after we've had such interest rate adjustments, yes. we're not seeing more companies going under? 
Well, I think um, it's not surprising for us in Asia, um, as I said earlier, because of the vibrant economy growing uh, in the region, not only China opening up, but India has done tremendously well, Indonesia, and the ASEAN countries as well. Um, our market in Hong Kong has seen the resilience, definitely. Um, we had, um, you know, 2022 was a challenging year for everyone. And we saw liquidity coming back. And that's always a good sign. I think the investor sentiment is improving. Um, they're looking into 2023, maybe with the recession in mind, but still the investability of some of the corporates are coming back. And investors are always looking for growth. When we see increased liquidity, that means increased sentiment uh, more on the positive side. So uh, for our second, for the Hong Kong market, um, our first half of 2022 uh, was not good. And the second half almost double that of the first half. And in December in particular, we have seen a gradual return of positive investment attitude towards China. And I think that was in anticipation of the opening up. And I think that has to be a key uh, imp improvement for us. Uh, Mario, were, were you were you surprised, I guess, about the resilience of a lot of these businesses, given the, the 12 months that we've had? Well, given the size of the shocks, uh, it's hard not to say that we were a little bit surprised. But let's get back uh, one step uh, and, and see uh, how we were prepared or not to, to, to face the, this sort of crisis. Uh, and uh, especially in Europe, and I will be talking more on Europe, and, and, and an example in Europe, Portugal, we were much, much better prepared this time uh, for the sort of crisis that we faced than in 2008 or 2011 in Portugal with the sovereign debt crisis. Uh, the deleveraging process was quite effective. Risk reduction was kind of across the board. Businesses uh, were much less in debt. Uh, if the numbers for Portugal are, are quite telling. In 2022, 20, uh, uh, businesses uh, are less in debt than in 2019. They actually accumulated more buffers, more savings than debt during this period. So yes, I will say uh, that uh, we, we, have, we have the instruments uh, both within businesses and also uh, politically, uh, the, poly the economic policy in Europe is a source of stability uh, today. Contrary to what happened in the past, no one worries uh, about, uh, about fragmentation in, in Europe. Uh, the euro area is much stronger today, much better instruments, uh, the institutions uh, that, that we set up during, during pre-COVID and during COVID were quite, quite important. It's not very often mentioned, but the, the issuance of common debt by the European Commission is uh, one of the greatest leap of integration in Europe. <laughs> and, and this is part uh, of Europe today. So I am um, very positive in the sense that the signs that we send to, to the businesses uh, from the policy arena uh, are much stronger than before. We don't, we don't show uh, signs of anxiety which is great. We learned our lessons. We, we are much more positive in that sense. And, and, and businesses uh, have responded quite positively. Uh, the economy uh, is, is still uh, growing um, a bit. I already mentioned the, that the environment is very, very difficult for Europe. But um, I think we, we are uh, on course. For I'm getting some great questions also from Slido, so please keep on sending those questions through. Axel, what are you seeing amongst your, your clients? So what are they telling us? I know Credit Suisse has also another set of issues, but overall, <laughs> is, are, are people confident about the future? Are they investing in real estate? You know, mortgages are going up. And this is a great question after a potential recession this year. When does it rebound? No, I think when you, when, when you look to you know, the entrepreneurial side, corporates and then also you know uh, uh, high net worth so the they, there's still a lot to invest they obviously last year went back a little bit more to cash but everybody is really looking what and where to invest and that's what i tried to, uh, to say there are huge uh, huge opportunities out um, and this is a time where 
and also innovation. We will see happening innovation, and we need to focus very much on the innovation agenda. On the shorter term, sure, we hopefully can avoid a recession, but that's a shake off of the economy. Supply chains are going to change, so ultimately that means costs go probably a little bit higher, but you know how quick you can adjust and how uh, the way you can uh, do it is, 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 really, is really important. What are the future technologies that will improve you know, economic growth going forward? So I think uh, the, the smartest people are looking for opportunities is how, where to invest and how to invest and, and look for ultimate for growth, yeah. And if you look, Douglas, at the energy complex and the mild winter that we had, frankly, that's helped a lot. Yeah, oh, that's been a huge positive. It's, it's an offsetting factor to some of the risk, especially in Europe. Uh, but following up a little bit on the, where the investments are for innovation and the demand for capital that's coming through, uh, you mentioned energy. The energy complex is going through a transition that there's a lot of demand for battery, for net grids, for all types of different approaches. In the U.S., there's going to be a large investment in chips, and, and there's this theme of reshoring, nearshoring, offshoring, friendshoring, et cetera. We think there will be a, a big shift of where capital is deployed. Last year was one of the weakest years for M&A, which is one of the reasons you saw some of the, uh, in, in the U.S. and some of the other banks uh, going for the downsizing. Um, and so we see this year there should be some sort of recovery in M&A. So there's not a lot, a lack of capital. It's more of the uncertainty is putting the capital on the sidelines. So uh, Laura mentioned liquidity. We think that there's ample liquidity, but it's on the sidelines waiting to see where do interest rates settle, what are the growth rates, Rates, what's going to happen with energy. So it's, it's not a lack of capital, it's a lack of certainty. Yeah. Um, Laura, can you talk to us about how you're expecting the China reopening to, to pan out in terms, of, mm -hmm. in terms of timeline, how bumpy it will be, and what we can expect in the next quarters? I think the first and foremost is that with the opening of the borders, there will be more tourists coming out. The Chinese um, uh, have always been big, uh, composing a large number of mm -hmm. tourists. Uh, certainly in Asia, everybody is waiting for the Chinese to come, and Hong Kong, no exception. So that will stimulate the consumption aspect. Within China itself, I think the manufacturing sector would have to pick up. There will be, uh, and it has been, you know, because of the disruption in supply chain, there might be some adjustment. But I think the bright spot in China is really the innovation part, you know, in technology, in healthcare. Hong Kong Stock Exchange, for example, we are now in a short period of three, four years, we have become the second largest fundraising center in the world for healthcare companies. And a large number of these are from the mainland. And um, the investors have a big appetite. And of course, you know, AI and other technology, exactly because of the chip situation, they will spur more domestic research and development, and that will create more demand. So I think, how do I see the, the the trajectory, I'm not sure whether it will be completely smooth, but definitely is in the right direction. And I think China, being the, given the size of the economy, once it picks up, it's going to be very fast. Um, we have seen it in past experience. Either they don't do it, if they made up their mind and they want to do it, I think the speed is something that um, will surprise us. Do, do you think that it will follow a similar pattern of what we saw in you know, Western economies of goods first and then service spending? Yes, I think so. Yes, I think goods and uh, surface and that it's, uh, I think basically is the consumption, that the domestic demand. Um, I want to move, I mean, we have a great question about actually, you know, how stakeholders can advance uh, some of the things that are important to our societies. But first, given we completely misread and misinterpreted a lot of the economies and inflation in the last 18 months, could I each ask you to maybe explain some of the data points. So when you look at the, the economy um, and given the predictions, what do you look at to be sure that you're looking at the right thing? Because we've had so many shocks that sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, we didn't see inflation coming and then it was a supply shock, but it was also something a little bit more underlying. Mario. Well, um, if, 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 um, if we are to, to, to pick correctly uh, the speed of the recovery, uh, I think we need to look at uh, soft data such as uh, confidence um, indicators uh, because uh, they usually are quite helpful to understand the macro cycles, uh, but we didn't see much there yet. So that, that will be uh, the, the, the theme. On, on the opposite side, um, to, to, to build self-confidence, it's the labor market. Uh, we have to be very careful uh, at uh, 
when, when we look at the labor market science, because this is the biggest uh, pillar uh, of all. Let me, let me pick a little bit uh, on, on this idea of onshoring and offshoring and, yeah. and the idea of recovery on, on, on Asia. We are, we are redesigning globalization. It's, I don't believe in deglobalization. I rather prefer the, the, the name reglobalization because we are uh, setting up again uh, hundreds of millions of interactions in the global economy. Uh, and I really hope that this time we, we can make it in a more inclusive way. Uh, we are at the World Economic Forum. Inequalities in the world are very important. I, I think we must really take the opportunity this time as we rebuild globalization to make it in a more sustainable way, also uh, in a more inclusive way. I would yeah. rather prefer to, to see growth spread across the globe than looking at, for example, yeah. cost factors uh, and be very greedy about the short term uh, in, instead of spreading the goods of globalization around the world. What does that look like? So concretely, <laughs> is it redistribution of wealth? Is it we have know, not done regional enough. that are more... Yeah, I, I, I don't think we, we've done enough yet. Uh, on redistribution? We, on redistribution, oh. we need to do more. Uh, we need to focus on broader uh, perspectives uh, instead of just, we, we recovered from COVID. The levels of the economies are already at the pre-COVID level or, 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 or above, but the economies are not the same. The composition of our economies are not the same. Uh, so we, we really need to take the next step uh, in a, with a broader perspective in mind, uh, not, not self-focusing uh, on, on what is going on in our closest yeah. neighborhood. Are, are, are we underestimating actually the profound change that a lot of the economies are going through, be, you know, partly due to interest rates, but also partly these changes in the economy? Yeah, I believe at least partially underestimate. I really believe it's somewhat the fundamental shift, what I said, energy costs. You know, Europe will have the highest average energy cost globally. That has an impact on competitiveness, not in the first half year this year, maybe not in the first, second half of this year, but for the next five or ten, uh, ten, uh, ten years to come. Then income inequality, when interest rates go up, hopefully in some countries, you know, we, have, we will see somewhat uh, uh, rebalancing. We all depend, uh, you, know, you were asking for economic indicators, I think even more important is the geopolitical situation. I mean, the world will develop depending on what is happening. Russia, Ukraine, in the Middle East, in the, uh, China, Taiwan, whatever can happen, we all still read the lips of central bankers. They blink a little bit with the eye and then <laughs> you get depressed or you get optimistic. <laughs> you know, but it tells it. you how fragile <laughs> the overall world is. And then, you know, we said supply chains will get adjusted. We will have a multipolar polar world. So not everybody will move in the same, in the same pattern. Uh, you know, China will be different. I, uh, uh, India will come. <coughs> Middle East, that's a huge growth support. It's a, it will be a center of growth. It's the energy center. And when you look what's happening there, people really look to craft their strategy for the next 50 yeah. years. It's unbelievable the change that is taking place. So I really believe we will see a reconfiguration of the economy, of economic growth patterns. And uh, that is the real topic rather than the shorter term you know, impact on this year. You asked the question about what sort of indicators would we be looking at, and there's the traditional indicators that are just traditional growth of economic growth, what's happening with interest rates, what we see in different sectors. There's the other leading indicators like PMI and looking at electric consumption, et cetera, what you see around economies. The two factors which have been not consistent with, with the recession, the first one is uh, what's been happening with the labor markets. Strong labor markets are not consistent with what we see with the recession, and the labor markets are strong almost everywhere in the world. China's labor market has been quite weak. We've seen reports of, of uh, unemployment levels as high as 18 percent of youth unemployment. But once the economy starts opening up and fast food and services open up again, that should absorb that type of youth unemployment quite quickly. So unemployment levels are not consistent. And then the other is what we watch with markets. What do markets believe? And we've seen incredible volatility. Last year, there were more days of the VIX over 20 than there ever had been in the past. So the volatility makes it harder to read what the markets are thinking, although right now we do see that the spread in the U.S. between the 10-year and the two-year 
year is, is very negative, which could actually portend a recession. That's what the market typically thinks when you're seeing that. But, but on the other hand, the 10 years gotten so low, it's actually bringing back credit to the market. People are issuing again. They're starting to invest again because the 10 years gotten so low. So there's a lot of conflicting factors that we normally watch, and they're not all going the same direction. I mean, the, the, so I'm not a labor economist, but there's a lot of studies saying that partly it could be you know, long COVID, people dropping out of the workforce, so not even looking for a job anymore. It could also be explained with a skill shortage. So are we too optimistic about the, the, the kind of jobs, the quality jobs that we are, we are or not creating? Well, it's partially that there is a, there's a cha shift in the types of jobs. So there was some of that. There was, the labor participation rate has dropped, so that is part of the, part of the explanation. But, but let me give you a structural question for the U.S. economy again, where I'm, I'm coming from. And that is that if we want to have a huge investment in semiconductors, if we want to invest in the energy transition which is coming, do we have skilled labor for pipe fitters, machinists, people are going to be able to build that, do that kind of construction? I don't know if we do in the United States. So there, that labor pressure could continue and we could see the need for a much more comprehensive immigration reform to bring in the kind of skills we need. So it's not just technology skills and STEM skills, we're also going to be seeing the need for basic manufacturing and skilled labor. Um, Lord Shah, to Axel's points, do you see a shifting of the economies of the center of gravity actually shifting maybe from, from the West elsewhere? Uh, I definitely see that um, as, you know, that's, as Asia's uh, growth engine uh, performing, I think uh, that will counterbalance some of the recessionary uh, pressure elsewhere. But as, market, uh, as a market operator, we, the data point that we have is one, the companies that are on the way to market, we have uh, on, on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, we have a strong pipeline. We have over 100 companies lining up to want to go to market. The second data point is the liquidity. We see liquidity coming back. So both on the demand and the supply side, these are very positive signs. And on the reglobalization, I think it is very important to remember that if we call it, you know, however we want to call it, globalization is not going away, but it's being reshaped, being reimagined, being, you know, however one, uh, we want to say, it is very important to be connected. And I think, you know, in, in Hong Kong, we pride ourselves on being the connector. We connect China with the world. We connect today with tomorrow, with the new companies. And I think that's very much so in, the, in Asia as a whole. Mm -hmm. It's that the younger generation, the population is a young one in Asia. Um, and India, Indonesia, Vietnam, you know, a lot of the ASEAN countries have, while China has an aging population, Japan has an aging population, the rest of Asia has a very yes. young growing one. And that has to be a very positive source. I also have a question on the African continent, which we'll get to a second, but Mario, so as this is a great question from Slido, um, from someone in the audience. So how can public and private stakeholders advance financial literacy, but also anything else really to try and mitigate the risks that we're facing? Like, how can we work together more concretely? Well, that's a very good question, <laughs> indeed, uh, and very hard to answer uh, con in concrete in, in such a, a, a short period of time. But uh, we can we, we can we can look out there uh, and um, and and use uh, all the instruments we have in policy terms uh, in Europe, in the US, globally, to to promote to promote growth uh, in other parts of the world as well. The, that that will help alleviating the the pressure on prices as well, uh, on uh, uh, fixing the supply chains. We we don't need to to uh, undo all uh, that COVID did to us, but to 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 construct something. Oh. Uh, something more sustainable. We we cannot uh, forget about climate climate change uh, that we need uh, really to tackle. And the only way to do this is to reduce the pressure on specific areas of the globe that are today already overcrowded. That's 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 my point. And, and we have the instruments. We have the development banks. We have uh, funds that can be directed uh, to that. We have, of course, the private sector that needs to 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 also uh, <laughs> give an answer to this global challenge, uh, which is not specific of uh, of. Uh, 
as a, a given jurisdiction uh, in, in the world. Let, let me pick up uh, very, very quickly yeah. on, on the labor market issue because it really is, is key. Uh, and, and, and just to, to say that in contrast with what happened in the US, in Europe, we did not destroy as many jobs as, as the US did uh, during COVID. That made um, our recovery much simpler in some sense in, the, in, in Europe. We did not have the pressure to rehire millions and millions of workers uh, in, in the European labor market. That reduced very much the pressure on wages. Uh, and, and we were very successful at doing that in Europe this time around. So usually, Europe is much more stable okay. across the cycle. This time, uh, we, 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 we got it better, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so usually it's more difficult for Europe. It is, uh, because Europeans uh, often do not really believe uh, on their own strengths. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Axel? Look, I think in terms of private public uh, partnership, I think uh, education, training, upskilling will be a key, key theme, even for the global economy. Now, you, in the US, you have migration, but you don't get the specialist you need for technology jobs and others. I look to Switzerland. Switzerland has, for the last 20 years, basically a, a population growth of nearly 1% of the population. This year, 2%. We have labor shortages in terms of uh, in engineers, uh, software uh, engineers, some financial specialists, healthcare. Part. So we, we have a lot of people that want to work, but not the right skill sets. So it's not only done in looking for more migration. It's not only done in Europe. We all, most people are used to retire between 60, 65. One day we will all be used to retire with 70, 75 or whatever, but that's not yet done. It's really the constant reskilling. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, a big, big opportunity. It starts at kindergarten. It ends when you're close to retirement age. That constant partnership, uh, I, I think it's a, it's a key theme. Uh, to make sure, you know, we can avoid more inequality, yep. bring people yep. into the labor market, because Definitely. people in the labor market, they are integrated, they are engaging in society, and I think that's, uh, I think, a, a great theme. But this is what politicians or leaders that have to focus well, on that. And yeah. again, it's a, time, a problem with timeline is that this takes 10, 20 years, but politicians get reelected every couple of years, so maybe they want yeah, a quick Yeah, but fix. you know, there, there are examples. In Switzerland, we have that apprenticeship system. Yeah. That's why we fare quite well with the workforce. We, have, uh, we see that partially happening in the US. We see that partially happening in Germany. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some models that can be used. And I'm with you. This is not something that can you do from one day to the other. It's five, 10 years. It's 15 years. But that's a big, big public-private, I think, mm -hmm. thought leadership activities that need to happen. Douglas, who do you see as the post, if not recession, post slowdown winners in all of this, e e either by country or companies or industries? Well, first of all, we, we talked about Asia and Asia's growth and Asia's opportunity. I would add an element of uh, the demographic dividend. What countries still have young populations? Where will you see the natural growth coming? And will those countries and nations have the ability to educate and move the populations into the new areas? We haven't talked a lot about um, climate change and energy transition or what we're seeing in the financial markets, but those that are able to move fast to think about energy transition get ahead in terms of how they look at uh, moving into new types of energy, the energy grid, et cetera. So I think that the, those will be very important factors. There's another factor which, um, coming back to the U.S., which we've always seen the resilience of the U.S. and the entrepreneurial spirit, even things like the tax code help that. You can write off something very quickly so people are willing to take risk, they're willing to fail fast. And I think bringing this type of an, a mindset to different countries around the world will also be beneficial. So I do think that we will see the, the winners will be those countries that are resilient, that have education systems that can adapt to a future market where supply chains are going to be changing. Let me just mention two seconds about Africa. I was going to ask you and if this was that, a decade for Africa. And, yeah, and Africa does have those benefits of the, of the uh, demographic dividend as well as the types of minerals that are going to be necessary for the energy transition as well as some of the conditions for producing some of the new energy sources. So Africa has a lot of opportunity uh, to play a much bigger role in the world. Um, Laura, when you look at um, the, you know, the post-recession or post-slowdown winners, 
who do you think they are and can, can, can other corporations or can other regions emulate what they're doing to be in a better place? Well, I think the winners will be the innovators. Um, not by that I don't mean only the new economy company, but some of the old economy company, they, they have innovation as well. I think that's very important in terms of the mindset, in terms of training the next generation of the engineer and the work in the workforce, basically upskill, reskilling the workforce. Uh, those will be the winner, and healthcare and uh, technology definitely, and ESG leaders. I think those are the three areas that I would see that as winners. Who do you see as winners? Mm, yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree with what uh, Laura said, and also on the on the education um, dimension. I think if we have to uh, to to bet on something uh, that is uh, that is pro development, it will be education. Uh, I, ca I can give you very quickly uh, again uh, and publicize here the numbers for Portugal because they really main, mean uh, a, a true transition in education terms for, for, for my country in the last 20 years. Uh, it will t still take uh, further 20 years because uh, we start this century with very low level of education. Only 40% of young people uh, graduating from high school. Uh, uh, now it's 85%. We are on the top of the numbers for, for the euro area. Uh, this, is, this is a true transition and, and this is uh, what, uh, yeah. what we need uh, to the future. The same thing is true for Africa. Uh, I think there's a massive uh, need for uh, education uh, in, yes. in Africa. We need to invest in that. It, it is a global issue. It's, it's not an African issue. I, I think it's very, very important for all of us to understand that. Okay, I have one minute each for, for each of you. W what is the one thing that we're, even if we're positive, we could be underestimating? So is there a challenge for a lot of the leaders listening to us and watching at home and on TV? What's the one thing that we could, if not getting wrong, certainly uh, underestimating that how challenging it is to overcome? Well, one, one thing that I haven't talked about yet from, from one of the internal views from S&P Global is the credit risk in the markets. We talked about, I talked about some of the positive yeah. aspects of it, but over the last 10 years, there's been a lot of issuance of high yield debt uh, in the corporate sector. And we don't know what's the behavior going to be of that once we see the resetting of interest rates, when those companies have to come back to the market to, uh, to renew their debt when they have maturities, as well as many of those types of companies or industries that will be more negatively impacted by the recession. So is there a question mark? Is there some sort of a, a debt bubble in some parts of the economies? That would be one of my questions. Yeah, Laura, what are we underestimating? I think the geopolitical instability is something that is out of our control. Um, it is in the hands of the politicians and the different governments, and it, it's truly for the corporate, you have to navigate, and for market operator, we have to navigate very carefully, but it is not something that we can uh, have, a, you know, have a say or have a hand on. Mario? Well, uh, I, I think the geopolitical uh, tensions are certainly uh, the, probably for Europe, especially the, the biggest thing. Uh, I will cite um, uh, a British philosopher, John, John Lennon, give peace a chance. <laughs> is, there <a laughs> is there anything that leaders can do today to try and mitigate that? There, there's a lot. There's a lot. And we have the instruments. That's why I have... Uh, this confidence that we can avoid recession, going back to the first yeah. question, and, and, and looking, looking to, to, to the future with, with a bright, as a bright spot. Yeah. We, 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 we can do it. We are improving a lot institutions across the globe. We need really to put that in practice. You also think they have the tools. It's something yes, that we need to I not think it is. It, I think it is uh, up to the leaders to work out what would be the best for the world. In that, you know, taking into account obviously their own interests. But I would say that for for the market, for corporates, it is something we have to learn to live with, to deal with. But very little that we can do. Axel, what are we underestimating? Very difficult to add something, but I think, you know, to foster innovation, entrepreneurship, get flexibility, freedom for companies and individuals to develop, to prosper. It's one key theme that we should really be very focused. And the second one we didn't touch really is, you know, even in Europe or even in the Western world, there are a lot of people that struggle these days. So the topic of social unrest, we didn't touch upon it. But to make sure that, you know, people can follow the development of the world, the economic development and 
can participate in that, you know, that shift into that multipolar world, that is very, very important. And that brings me back to what you started out on the geopolitical and, and all the tensions uh, that, that, that we are seeing. So I think that, that question of you know, growing inequality, how can we start to balance that? And then innovation will be key. Is there a danger that politicians don't tackle that head on? I mean, Mario mentioned this, and it could be through redistribution. I live in the UK where child poverty numbers are really shocking. Uh, I think the jury is still out. Okay, on whether we can do something. Thank you so much for a wonderful, spirited panel. So thank you all. And we will see whether uh, some of this positive optimism comes through. Mario Centeno, Laura Cha, Axel Lehman, and Douglas Peterson. Thank you and have a great day, everyone.